speaker tonight. There we go. Uh, so we have Kathy Cavallo, uh, who is co-founder of Remember the Wild, and Kathy will tell you all about that fantastic organisation and the work that they do. Um, Kathy is also Dr. Kathy. Um, so she has um, a PhD studying little penguin ecology, which is really very, very interesting, though not the topic we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so Kathy's going to talk to you about some sort of bigger issues and, and bigger values of things like storytelling um, and helping us connect with our local bird life or other um, aspects of nature. Uh, so we're going to ask you, of course, to reflect on your own moments that you have had with nature. As I said, pop those in the chat and we will, of course, hopefully hear from some of you uh, later on. And with that, um, I'm excited to introduce Kathy Cavallo. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Holly, and thanks, Annie. It's uh, so lovely to be here tonight and thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm just going to sort out presenter mode and get my slides up. I'm tuning in today from the lands of the Dja Dja Wurrung um, in central Victoria where I've recently uh, moved and absolutely loving it here, the beautiful... Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to find my slides. Um, yeah, the beautiful, frosty, crisp weather we've been having throughout winter that's led to beautiful sunny days filled with birds and the waddles coming out at the moment. It's just incredible. Um, Holly, can you tell me what, if I'm presenting anything quite yet? Not now, no. Excellent. That's what I would like because otherwise it might have been not what I wanted. Um, just sharing again. There we go. Okay, hopefully that's my first slide there. Excellent. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everyone. Again, um, I'm going to be talking tonight about something that's really close to my heart and a very important part of our work at Remember the Wild. So I'll give you a quick background on who Remember the Wild are. Um, we are Australia's leading nature connection organisation with focus on connecting people with nature and leading a, a positive shift in the way Australians value the natural world. And that's for the benefit of both people and planet. We know that people respond to stories rather than facts. And so in our work, we use principles of narrative, eco-psychology and behaviour change. And we pair these with novel and immersive media um, to intercept people where they are. And a lot of that time that's behind a screen. So we do a lot of work, um, storytelling work through film and through social media. And that's where you might have seen us before. Um, and tonight we're going to talk to, we're going to talk about basically something that was really the, the causal factor um, for why we launched Remember the Wild um, so many years ago. Um, and yeah, the life that's brought me to work with Remember the Wild has always revolved around birds and nature. It's always been about birds for me. Wherever I've lived, there have been birds. Um, my parents and grandparents uh, really encouraged bird watching and writing bird lists on holidays and and that's kind of held throughout my life. I look out for birds in my backyard and on walks every day. And I'm, unless I'm distracted by my phone, I'll be listening. Even if I'm walking with someone, I'm, I'll be distracted by a bird. Watching birds makes me feel happy and comforted and in good company. Sometimes their antics make me laugh and sometimes I feel buoyed by their apparent joy. I always feel the thrill if they come close and I love to be close enough to them to see their feathers and the twinkle in their eye. Gaining the trust of a wild animal like that is a wonderful secret. I love encountering a companionable little flock of small bush birds like little thornbills or silver eyes hopping around together, always in contact. And throughout my life, I've really enjoyed building relationships with the magpies that visited my parents' um, home back in Melbourne. I love that the male that used to live there would sing under his breath when I was with him, chortling quietly to himself and practising his repertoire of different bird calls. It always felt like that was just for me <laughs> because he wasn't doing it loud enough for anybody else. Um, at the moment, I'm really, really enjoying um, the new the flocks of tiny birds that are spending so much time in our new garden in central Victoria here. We've got a big kiwi vine, something I never thought that I'd own, and it's beautiful 
well-established Kiwi vine covered in Kiwis at the moment. And so every day it's been, um, every day through winter, it's been just full of silver eyes, stabbing holes in the Kiwi fr fruits, um, little red browed finches and fairy wrens hopping up there and, and dropping off to, to pick at the little bugs on my herbs. And we've had rosellas eating the dandelion seeds and lawn. It's, it's been constantly busy. And even if I never ate a single kiwi in my life, I'd still love that one. <laughs> we don't need to feed the birds. We just try and plant the right shelter and provide water. Um, but I still want them to come close to notice and feel comfortable, to notice me and feel comfortable in my presence. There's something so magical about sharing a connection with a non-human animal and more so when they're wild, I think, more so than when they're our pets. And a regular visitor is something really special, especially when you start to notice the unique characteristics and behaviours. Birds really become part of your family and our community. And for me, I'm someone who's struggled with loneliness and homesickness a lot through my life. And the presence of birds really, really does help me feel less alone. But um, why is that? <laughs> Why are we so drawn to nature? Why, why is it so important to me to be able to get out and see birds or bugs or just the plants in my garden every day? It's something that we're really fascinated at remember, with at Remember the Wild. It would probably seem obvious to most of you here, but humans have an innate tendency towards nature. It's not instinctual. It doesn't produce hardwired, rigid behaviours but it's a foundation upon which all of our individual relationships with nature is built. And it's really integral to our survival as a species. This innate tendency to be attracted to natural environments and affiliate with other living beings is described as biophilia. For most of our evolution, we've depended upon the natural world for our food, shelter and safety. So it's been an adaptive advantage to be able to seek out environments that are resource rich and provide shelter. It wasn't until the Neolithic period when we started to domesticate animals for agriculture, a mere 5% of our evolution, I think, um, that we started to separate ourselves from wild nature and see it as a threat to our good domestic nature, our stock, our crops, and our working or companion animals. We built permanent structures to shelter ourselves from the elements, and it became less important to our health and safety to be able to track and predict changes in the weather and our environment. But there's pl plenty of evidence today to show that our reliance on nature is deeply ingrained in modern humans through that co-evolution co with our environment and cultural evolution. We still surround ourselves with pets and plants and we find comfort in the outdoors and, ch and choose nature as the setting for so many of our recreational and celebratory and social activities. We still prefer resource and shelter rich natural environments like beaches and coral reefs and rainforests over those that might have historically had less to offer in the way of food and shelter. And we're always drawn towards sources of fresh water. I'm sure each of us will identify with that. <laughs> we know that we love visiting the beach or the forest and that we feel better after a picnic outdoors or a quiet walk along the creek. And increasingly the science is backing this up. What we always knew inside, that contact is nature, contact with nature is good for us. It really is. There's a, a general consensus among scientists that nature contact is related to a huge suite of um, important physical, mental, social, and social health benefits, as well as our own development as kids. Um, some of those things include increased psychological well-being, happiness positive social interactions, cohesion and engagement, a sense of meaning and purpose in life, decreases in mental distress. Like literally the list I'm reading it here goes on and on and on. Um, and there's also a consensus that contact with nature is associated with a reduction of risk factors and burden in, term, in, in, in some types of mental illness. Um, and it improves sleep reductions in acute and chronic stress and associated with lower incidences of anxiety disorders, ADHD and depression. And I'm one of the many people here that um, has for a large part of my life su suffered or um, yeah, suffered from an, an anxiety and depression disorder. And I can tell you that um, interaction with nature is a key part of keeping me on an even keel every week. So I've got this little, um, I'm gonna look at my other slide which is next to me because this will be too small for me to see. 
Um, but I just wanted to show you a little bit of the background for those pathways for where nature does actually affect our physical, mental, social well-being. Um, this, this picture that I'm going to show you is from a paper by Quo et al. in um, 2015. Um, it's a really good review on the benefits of nature for human health and well-being, if you are interested in that. Um, and the more recent research he, um, just backs most of this or all of this up. So time in and around nature, things like walking in nature, the views of nature, um, local green space, those sorts of things have a, um, a suite of different effects on our own health and well-being. I'm going to bring two parts of this image up at once for us. So on one, on one side, there are a lot of things in nature um, compounds that plants and salt water and freshwater environments create that actually bring about the release and and regulate um, different compounds in our bodies that have um, health health protective effects so um, some of these things include um, negative air ions which have been associated with reducing depression in people um, phytoncides um, have a large impact in a lot of um, immune disorders and basically all of these different things have a large impact on our immune structure immune function and the way that our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous um, activity is regulated in the body and the nervous activity by parasympathetic and sympathetic systems actually drives our immune system behavior and that has long-term health consequences so through these different pathways, nature has a huge impact on health health outcomes from ranging from um, mental health disorders and conditions right through to long-term um, serious diseases such as cancer and cardiovascular disease and even provides effective fact, uh, protective factors against things like diabetes, um, and yeah, you can see this huge list of things on there. Um, basically, it causes these, these interactions between active ingredients of nature and the compounds in our bodies cause our bodies to shift into healthier states. Um, and then the, the sights and sounds of nature help regulate our um, stress and relax, relaxation systems and through that in, increase our immune health as well. So some of the other, um, sorry, I'll just skip through just a little tiny bit. This is what happens when I write too many notes for one side. <laughs> and one of the things, the other things that I wanted to mention that I think is really important to this talk tonight is that nature, it, it, contact with nature seems to satisfy our psychological need for relating and belonging. And I think that's something that's quite separate to the immune and physical health benefits that nature is providing maybe through more direct routes. Um, even though we are, we separate ourselves from nature so much, um, we still have this deep affinity for it and relate to it with empathy in the same way that we relate to each other. And I think that's part of this pathway that helps, uh, helps nature to ease loneliness and feelings of isolation in people. Some of the other important things in terms of cognitive and psychological health that um, net contact with nature affects is um, it trends back, goes back to that kind of evolution that we've had that where we've sought out safe and resource, ri resource rich environments. So interacting with safe, resource rich environments, green spaces, these days evidence has shown that it does reduce stress. It's, it restores cognitive processes. And part of this is because we, as people, we respond with involuntary attention to natural settings. This guarantees that our attention that we've been putting on ourselves and on our work can rest and that restores our mental fatigue. Um, and another really important thing in terms of childhood development is the way that it, it affects um, growing kids and, and then adults' ability to as assess risk and to problem solve. 
In 2019, a study from the UK showed that those who spent at least two hours per week interacting with nature reported better overall health and higher psychological well-being than those that didn't. What's really important is that it didn't matter whether that time was spent in one two-hour visit or multiple shorter ones. I know this from my own life. It's the frequency of moments in nature, not big chunks of time that keep me on an even keel and, and make me feel feel good in my days. Every new bird or flower bud I notice in my garden, every unfurling leaf on one of my indoor plants, each single encounter, each moment of curiosity, beauty, love, or wonder gives me a little boost. And that really raises my spirit and grounds me throughout my day. And the cumulative impacts of those little nature moments across my week is huge. So I was wondering, and I might ask Holly and, and Annie, um, maybe how does contact with nature affect your life? Ooh. Um, it is my life. <laughs> really? yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, despite working for BirdLife, a lot of my time is spent in front of the computer mm -hmm. um i don't actually get the opportunity to go and do a huge amount of birding anymore but i know that the times that i do i feel re-energized it reminds mm -hmm. me why i do what i do um but it also um just it calms me incredibly and so um i'll do one very very quick um example was uh, we were I was out in the field um, last mm -hmm. week setting up a, a site so getting to do some some field work which was around nature connection um, interestingly enough um, and we came to a site and there was some open lawn space and just weeds everywhere like mm -hmm. anybody would look at this and go Ooh, and I went oh more birds yeah and we sat on the grass under a tree and just watched this whole area just come to life with mm. fairy wrens and silver eyes and red brad finches. Bull bulls introduced, doesn't matter, they were amazing. And I walked away from that sort of watching this effective mm. performance on the lawn in front of me and just went, oh, yeah, this is it. Life is good. Yep. These birds are here. We are sharing our space and it was an amazing experience. Yep. Yeah, I um every single time that something, especially a community of little birds, I think there's something really exciting about that because they're different species too. And somehow they're interacting together, coming to the same resource, speaking basically to each other with the same little contact calls and communication calls. Um yeah, I don't know what we'd do without it, Holly. <laughs> no, I don't want to know, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I might ask Annie the next question unless she's right here but I'll pop on to the next bit because I think this is really important and maybe people might want to reflect in the chat with how contact with nature affects your everyday because the problem is that increasingly as a society we're having fewer and fewer of these moments of connection as we spend more time inside um, in managed environments with overscheduled timetables we're losing our opportunities to encounter nature incidentally. And that's um, increased for people that live in really urbanised environments. Nature has become a hobby. Like people might look at Holly and I and the rest of us here and think, oh, you, you bird watch, that's cool, that's that's your hobby. Um, when re in reality, our health and well-being still relies on daily contact. The very fact that we refer to non-human life as nature, something separate to ourselves is both symbolic and symptomatic of our divergence from the natural world we, we depend on. In reality, we are nature, even if we don't see ourselves th that way. And this increasing isolation from the rest of nature has occurred in parallel with a lot of the technological advances that have, that have allowed us to feel less reliant on the processes of nature for our safety. So the houses that we live in um, shelter us from the elements. So most changes in weather are largely irrelevant to our safety, although now in the climate crisis, there's obviously a limit to what our houses can protect us from. But these enclosed sterile spaces also allow us to keep out wild animals. So we no longer have to pay attention to the wildlife we share space with and be able to identify those that are safe from those that might not be. Um, advances in food production mean we don't have to think about seasons. We don't have to think about safe food identification when we're filling our pantry. And, and these things have really resulted in a, a lowering of the relevance of local nature 
to our our lives because we don't you know we used to have to know what things were safe to eat and what things were safe to be around and we just don't have to anymore we've also got a world of entertainment and information at our fingertips online and increasingly the playtime we would have spent in nature is spent entertaining ourselves indoors and this has resulted in a generational loss of environmental knowledge and interest known as the extinction of experience this insidious pervasive and snowballing alienation from nature is one of the greatest threats, if not the greatest threat to our survival as a species and to our environment. So the term the extinction of experience was coined by the butterfly scientist, writer and teacher Robert M. Pyle in 1975, as he lamented the loss of incidental nature in, the, in his growing suburbs. Pyle wrote, as cities and metastasizing suburbs forsake their natural diversity and their citizens grow more removed from personal contact with nature, awareness and appreciation retreat. This breeds apathy towards environmental concerns and inevitably further degradation of the common habitat. And so it goes on and on, the extinction of experience sucking the life from the land, the intimacy from our connections. People who don't know won't care. And what is the extinction of a condor to the child who has never known a wren? That's a really poignant point and something that really hits us at Remember the Wild really hard because I guess each of us grew up with interest in nature. Um, and the, f the feeling that some of the things that we hold so dear might be things that people never experience is, is terrifying. The causes of this phenomenon are bound together in an accelerating positive feedback loop. The fewer opportunities we have to encounter nature, the less it interests us the less we're interested in connecting with nature, the less often we're going to seek out experiences with it. At Remember the Wild, we include this in this, the fact of the biodiversity crisis and the snowballing reduction in just the number of living things, living beings in our urban environments. The fewer individual animals um, and plants there are to encounter and the lower the species diversity of the area, the less interesting our environment is overall. And as these causes yeah. can round and round in a cycle of disaffection there are serious consequences for our health and that of the planet um so click yes disconnecting with nature has detrimental effects on our mental health our physical and our social health and importantly it diminishes um, positive attitudes and inclination towards nature and its pro-environmental behaviors without a circuit breaker we're in real trouble So I'm going to save this question to the end, actually, because I'm very good at running out of time. But I think it's worth reflecting on whether particularly people that have lived longer in, in this chat and that have experienced maybe a larger part of the, the technological acceleration that we've been through, it would be interesting to reflect on what you've noticed about the difference between your childhood and the childhood of um, the people around you and whether you've noticed the, this extinction of experiences in nature in your own life. I'm in trouble clicking my slides, sorry everyone. But this is where birds come in. Um, and I'm gonna read this beautiful poem from Emily Dickinson because I think it speaks to why we connect so deeply with birds and the hope that we need now to deal with the climate and biodiversity crisis together. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. We love our birds. Birds are the most visible and one of the most engaging faunal components of our urban and non-urban ecosystems. Wherever we live, birds live. Even in the most barren of concrete jungles, there are going to be sparrows and rock pigeons. We're drawn to their beauty and their apparent freedom. We envy their flight and their beautiful plumage. They're so familiar to us, yet so strange, curious, unknowable, so much so that in the past we created what now seem like completely nonsensical explanations for their behaviours. Like 
because barnacle geese were never seen to breed, people imagine they emerged fully formed from goose barnacles. And when swallows migrated south for winter, Europeans imagined they were just hibernating in the mud at the bottom of ponds. They were so mystical to us for so long, and I think that's a large part of why we are so fascinated and so in love with bird life. We recognise in, in them some of the same behaviours and values we associate with ourselves and other mammals, and we can empathise with them and imagine some of their experience. These lorikeets here um, were a pair that I used to watch in Adelaide um, on Ghana country when we used to live there. The female, actually I'm assuming it's a female but it might not be, is missing part of her beak. And despite this fact, her partner nurtured her and cared for her and preened her with love and they bred and they probably bred the next year as well. And for a bird that well, for a lorikeet that needs to br break into um, eucalypt blossoms to get nectar and, and you know, it uses that beak, not having that tip is a really serious issue. But I guess we might um, relate to perhaps the love and the care in that relationship between this pair that carried them through that storm. Some of the other things that draw us to birds are the fact that they that their presence and behaviour is so strongly tied to the seasons and reminds us of the cycles of life, dawn to dusk, spring through winter. Pre-clocks and calendars, birds helped us mark time. And so many of them are about in the daytime and accustomed to our presence and share our territories, the same space with us, for years and years and years. There's scientific evidence for a, posit a significant positive association between seeing or hearing birds and improved mental well-being for humans, even hours after an encounter. Even just listening to recordings of bird sound can alleviate paranoia, anxiety and depressive symptoms. So they're really important to us and we love them. But is everybody getting the benefits of interacting with nature, interacting with our birds every day? If not, maybe um, I'll show you some tips for how you could get to know them a bit better. So... Um, how can we not begin to notice nature and connect with our birds? Uh, it is simple, but it's not easy. And I think that's why we struggle with it so much. In our fast-paced, overscheduled lives, it takes real effort to slow down and connect. And anyone who's practised mindfulness or yoga or meditation will tell you that. But they'll also tell you it's worth it. Um, we need to take time, pay attention, use our senses and be curious and open to what we might find when we watch birds. And I'll go through each of those. Unfortunately, we've not discovered the ability to make time. Whenever I hear someone say, I've got to make time for this, I know that that's not possible. We can't make time, we can't find time. All we can do is take time and that means that wanting to connect with nature has to compete with one of the other things that you want to do in your day. And that's one of the reasons people find it increasingly hard to spend time in nature because we have so many competing priorities. But during the pandemic, research by our Remember the Wild team found that when we were forced to slow down, people really enjoyed watching their local birds. Um, they watched them for longer and more often, and that gave birds individuality and identity. And it... Um, alleviated some of the stress in people's lives and gave them something that grounded them. So it is really worth it to take time. And like we've seen from recent studies, it doesn't have to be long. Even just a little nature moment, like when you're hanging out the washing, which is one of the things that I like to pair with nature watching, um, is, is something. Um, and you can pair it with another activity like that if you want, as long as the activity is not too distracting. So I like to take my tea breaks outside when I can, um, really looking forward to more warmer weather so that I want to do that. Um, I force myself out on early walks with my dog, which he needs, but when we do go for our walks, we spend time waiting on the bridge and listening and, and taking time to actually listen. Um, so there are so many ways throughout your day that you actually can take time to connect with birds. Sometimes you have to be a bit more inventive and sometimes it might be just through a window, but the absolute first step 
to connecting with nature is seeing it as something of, of enough of a priority to take time from your day to do. Then the key is to pay attention. This is another thing that's really hard for us, um, getting out of our head and actively attending to the world around us. Uh, it's hard, but it also is a huge relief if you can find, so if someone like me with a lot of anxious thoughts and going around all the time, it's a huge relief to be able to pay active attention to something else and not have to listen to myself for a bit longer. Um, but the paying of the attention is critical. Like we are experiencing nature every day. Every time we're walking from the house to the car or into work, we are hearing birds and we're passing by birds, but we're, sorry, we're listening hearing them and passing by them but we're just not listening to them or noticing them so paying active attention is the thing that you'll need to do to actually feel that moment of connection experience or experience wonder and this this is not getting sucked into your own thoughts and worries sitting there trying to trying to tune in and not get bored um is one of the hardest things about any mindful practice and it does take effort and patience um, but without paying active attention we won't notice anything about our native neighbors and they continue to be irrelevant to us so that's super key and one of the ways that you can help yourself to pay real attention is to use your senses try and listen really deeply and, and look closely and see what you notice could that slight rustling sound be a pair of red rump parrots nibbling grass seeds on your lawn I can't tell you how many people I've seen walk or ride straight past these urban jewels without actually being able to see them camouflage in the grass. If all the birds start calling at once, maybe that's a reason to look up and see if you can catch sight of a raptor whizzing by. You can use your eyes to take in the detail of a bird's plumage. Is it soft and subtle or sleek and shiny? How many colours are there and where are they on the, on the bird? These are the things that will help you identify the bird later if that's important to you. And even smell can alert you to the presence of a colony of birds as any seabird or, um, yeah, seabird or ibis researcher will tell you. Um, paying attention with our senses is an important mindfulness practice that grounds us in space and time and grounds us in what's actually happening around us. It, if all of this is sounding really very deliberate, it's because it is. We have to practice our nature connection if we haven't been doing it for, you know, for a long time, if we've been kind of ignoring nature around us or or not spending time connecting. Um, so it can take it can take time and, and deliberate effort to establish. One of the things that I think is really important is to actually be curious and in and open to what you're seeing. So we're humans are reflective storytelling thinking people and we we observe but observations aren't interesting to us unless we're thinking about them and connecting them to other things that we've known or know or experienced in our lives so try and really engage your curiosity and sense of wonder and empathy when you're watching a bird whether it's a single bird or a group of birds um the little things that they're doing um the times of day they come back these are all things that will tell you little bits about them and allow us to kind of um, understand a bit what about what their experience might be like. And if you needed more reason <laughs> to actually pay active attention and and engage your curiosity and, and interest in them, um, one scientific study found that it that the positive psychological effects of bird watching were highest for those who reflected upon the joy watching a bird gave them. So compared to people who just counted the number of birds that visited the place that they were meant to be watching from, those that watched the birds and actually thought about, actually took joy in the bird's presence had a much higher positive psychological effects and those were um, sustained after the, after the interaction. Oops. Oh no, let me just go back. Um, and yeah, um, I've put this one up here because I think it's important to think, to know that there are all different types of bird friends as well. 
and we can probably think about all of these in our own lives. There's the friends you have at home. It might be the magpie that visits every day. There's the friends at the park, maybe the corella pair that are building a nest in one of the big red gums nearby. There's seasonal friends that tell us the time of year. Um, for me, that's always been the pied currawongs signalling winter in Melbourne. There's birds tied to place. There's brief encounters you might have on holidays, like every time I go anywhere where there might be apostle birds, I definitely sit down to watch them gather about together. Um, there's the special visits from birds that you don't usually get that really bring a moment of wonder into your day and into your year. And there's those birds that you don't see but that you hear, like yellow-tailed black cockatoos flying over or um, fan-tailed cuckoo calling, signalling spring. All of these birds, we interact with them in different ways and hold they hold different meaning in our lives. One thing that is probably uh, encouraging for those of us who can't always get out every day is that there is actually evidence that watching um, nature videos and seeing pictures of nature um, can have a positive effect on your health and well-being. So obviously the um, effect is pronounced if you are connecting with nature in place with um, real nature, but even pictures and videos and, and live streams of nature can offer well-being benefits and increase our nature relatedness. And I think anyone who's watched the Collins Street Peregrine Falcons over the last few years will definitely relate to that. Um, and if you wanted to, yeah, partake in any watching of, of birds throughout the next couple of months, good news is that this is a nesting season for a lot of our raptors and there are three streams that I would definitely recommend checking into. So one is the um, Sea Eagle Stream. That's a bird life one in Parramatta, um, on the Parramatta River, I think. Uh, I think they've already got two chicks that their eggs hatched in late July and they're seriously cute and the adults are seriously beautiful. And sometimes I even just put that one on to hear the traffic on the road behind if I'm feeling a bit lonely because... <laughs> It um yeah it's it's everything happening in real time. Likewise, um, there's a pair of ospreys at Port Lincoln in South Australia, um, nesting on a barge, and they're they're really beautiful to watch. And then the peregrines um, in the Melbourne CBD, um, they're not live yet, but each year they draw an, a huge crowd um, to watch them nest and raise their chicks on the on the ledge of one of Mel Melbourne's big corporate buildings. Um, so well worth checking those out. And this is a point where I wanted to ask maybe Annie or maybe Holly whether knowing which species you're looking at enhances your connection with the bird. Because for me, like I'm someone who loves knowing what I'm looking at. I've, I've always listed everything, not competitively, but everything I find and I identify it and I write it down and that's exciting and I use iNaturalist all over the place. But I definitely know other people who think it's fussy to know what you're looking at and that it doesn't actually matter to them at all um, whether they know what, whether they can identify the bird to feel a connection with it. Um, so, yeah. And likewise, does it matter if the bird's native or not? I don't know. Holly think, or um, Annie? For me, I must be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So I think getting that initial, wow, this is exciting, uh, the biggest thing for me, maybe if it's something that I'm not used to seeing in a certain mm -hmm. spot, that will always make me pause what I'm doing and watch for a moment. Yeah. I do think that if I can then go home and get out my book and figure out what it is and yeah. do detective work, that adds that layer of excitement. Yeah. But I wouldn't say that there's, there's nothing there if I don't know what it is. I was... Um, yeah. Uh, on a trip recently and I saw my first top knot pigeons and I was oh, thinking, cool. what could that be? It's too big. It's too crazy. Um, but then the act of getting to go home and find out what it was and learn about it, I think mm. was its own kind of exciting discovery process mm -hmm. in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but whether it's native or not, I think that's another different one. I came into a meeting with Holly a couple of weeks ago and I had to announce that I'd just seen my first European goldfinches. Oh, yep. Birds. Um, and we do have a few around where I am and I'd never seen one. And I was still excited. I was yeah. probably more excited 
for them than some other non-native species that I, I might roll my eyes at. Um, yep. So maybe it comes into play, but it wouldn't completely ruin the experience for me, unless yeah. it was a bit of a cheeky one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. I think when I when I get the chance to go home and find and look it up again, um, that's really exciting to me. And and I, and and knowing a bit about what I'm looking at enriches my experience a bit as well. When I when I might know cool things like it's a visiting bird. So mm -hmm. at the moment we have heaps of tiny jewel like pardalotes around and silver eyes. And I know that both species have members that are resident in Victoria and members that travel from Tassie for the winter. So I'm always looking at them going, hmm, did you fly across Bass Strait? Because you're so small. And that is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and likewise with um with non-native birds, I, I think, I mean, obviously for our, a lot of our wildlife, it would be better if they weren't here. But I think it's really important like they still have a sense of they have agency and and they're living their own lives and I find it really interesting. Some of them, you know, like rock pigeons, mm -hmm. our rats with wings, incredibly mm -hmm. engaging birds and, mm -hmm. and very clever really. So I have yeah. some very charismatic sparrows in my life, mm -hmm. even though I know that it would in many ways be better that they're not there. Those sparrows did not choose to be here and I think it can yeah. be really tricky when it comes to moralising invasive mm -hmm. species how you express that when it comes mm -hmm. to individual animals. Mm -hmm. um, I can yeah. love a bird without wanting it to be here. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, definitely agree. And I can definitely identify with the excitement of seeing goldfinches. We've just had some in our backyard and <laughs> I know they're not meant to be here, but gosh, they're beautiful little they're finches. Mm -hmm. yep. Um. Well, I'm very good at running out of time, so I'm going to try and not do that. <laughs> But um, I guess just one thing to add, if, if you do want to deepen your understanding of the birds that are around you, there are so many great resources out there. Um, I should have listed the um, Urban Birds and, and Bird Life and Birds and Backyard websites um, because they are great ones for finding what's in your backyard. Then we've got field guides and some of these field guides are on, sorry, I didn't realise my mouse was going around every time I did that. Sorry, friends. Um yeah, some of those field guides are now great apps on your phone and you can actually listen to the bird calls as well within within each species profile. So I've got a couple of those on my phone and I find them really useful. I love using iNaturalist. It's not as handy for birds because it can be hard to get a photo of them, um, but apps like iNaturalist will help you discover what birds um, are around your area and what things might be. Um, going on guided walks or... Um, the Aussie bird count I think is the greatest gateway for people each year to get into birding because it's totally entry level. Um, it makes you sit down and watch birds for, it's a 20 minutes, holy, or any, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing it for like, I don't know, seven of those 10 years or something and I can't remember apparently. But, um, yeah, it's a good opportunity to sit down with a cup of tea, watch birds, see how many you can hear, see how many you can see see how many you can identify and the app that goes along with the Aussie bird count has all the different birds to help you identify what you're seeing and when you do record birds through the Aussie bird count you're contributing to our knowledge of the numbers and diversity of birds that we have across Australia and how that changes throughout years um, and along with environmental conditions and um, changing habitats so Definitely encourage everyone who hasn't already. I know this is a bird life crew, so most people probably have had a go at the bird count, but if you haven't, get into it this year and make sure you get your friends involved too. Um, so I'll go through some of the reciprocal benefits that we have for connecting with our local birds and starting with benefits for us. And this is where I'm going to share a couple of stories and hopefully not run out of time. <laughs> Um, for me, the birds, plants, insects and other living things in my backyard are a really important sense uh, source of connection and companionship and community. Um, I mostly work from home, but there's always so much activity going on outside my window that it helps ease my loneliness and motivates me through my day. Everywhere I've lived, I've been able to develop close relationships with certain birds, especially Maggie's. Um, some of these are one-sided, some of them I know were reciprocal, but even when there's no friendship, um, having a wild living being confident and trusting enough to go about its business in your presence feels like an enormous privilege and recognition of our shared space. Um, 
I once had this little troop of tiny baby scrub wrens scrabble across my lap before I realised I was there. That was early on when I was a kid and um, I loved birds, but I was still learning about them and I didn't realise that the adults were like really angrily scolding me to get out of here. And I was just sitting there going, oh, what are these cute little buzzy things? I just sit and watch them. And in the next moment um, I could see why they were so pissed off at my presence because their babies were just tramping across my lap completely unawares. Um, having moments like that make me feel part of something. Um, obviously, you know, the magpie that walks throughout my front garden, it's keeping an eye on me. I'm possibly a threat. I'm possibly irrelevant. Um, and, yeah, throughout my life I've had some really, come on, slide, really special friends. Um, it might go ahead. Yep, it's going to do that. There we go. We'll go back. This is what happens when you have too many pictures in your slides. Come on. Okay. These are just some of my um, Maggie and Pied Caramel friends from over the years. Actually, all of these were taken when I lived um, in Richmond during the pandemic. Um, we were lucky enough to have a balcony onto the Yarra River. And every time it rained, all of these guys would come and shelter on the balcony. Um, and over time, they got really comfortable with our presence because we were spending all our time at home. They were spending all their time foraging next to our balcony. Um, and we've got, yeah, Rowan and my partner and I have some really hilarious photos of really bedraggled young currawongs hanging around on the balcony. And it was a real um, privilege when the magpies bred that year and they started to bring their chicks to hang out on our balcony as well. We got to watch them kind of grow and obviously be so close to them to see how soft and fluffy they were. Um, Another thing that benefits us from connecting with birds is that they really ground us in time and place. Um, they help us tune into the seasons and rhythms of the world because they're active at dawn and at dusk and they want to have a siesta, especially on hot days. Um, I love that throughout the year the species mix changes. So when I used to live in Melbourne, I started to associate pied currawongs with winter. In the last few years of my PhD, I'd be sitting in the office at Monash hearing their calls ring across the campus. And in the dark, cold, cold darkening afternoons, their calls would be accompanying me on my walk to the tram or train uh, or car. Um, they'd flood, they just flood in from the surrounding countryside in winter and in vast flocks and they fill the grey skies with their calls. And I love that call so much. And the two years that I just spent in Adelaide, not having them around was actually really a lot harder than I expected. Um, yeah, some birds become a really important presence. One of some of the birds that have been important um, as well at home is uh, the birds that have raised families at our house and made our home their home. So in Adelaide, although we didn't have the pied currawongs, we had this wonderful pair of um, magpie larks. And when we were doing our backyard, and digging up a lot of the garden. The female came in all throughout her breeding season to dig up mud to make her nest with. And they actually made their nest in our um, carport. And we were treated to watching these tiny, tiny little feeble babies grow into these adorable chicks um, right above our car. So they, they had to get used to us because they had chosen maybe a silly spot to nest. And every time we came out of the house, they, they were there and the male and female would be bringing them food and things. And it actually surprised me how quickly they grew. But it also it also gave us an opportunity to see kind of whole of life situations because, unfortunately, only one of the chicks actually fledged. The younger one or the smaller one obviously didn't grow fast enough. So when the bigger one fledged and was ready to fly, the family left and kind of left the, the smaller one behind, and that was really hard. Um. And it's, it's been like a real privilege to watch all different birds raise their families around our home and in the parks nearby over time. I think it gives you something that fills your day and, and your season. So watching the um, Australasian grebes raise their babies on floating nests um, in the local park, it's amazing. Uh, watching the tawny frogmouth raise a, a chick that unfortunately didn't make it as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, baby baby birds are just so cute. They provide so much entertainment. And one of the other things that we've enjoyed is um, having cuckoos turn up and be hated on by all the other local bird life. 
Um, and then, of course, there's the constant antics that um, lorikeets and other parrots and cockatoos like the corellas um, give us every day. Um, I wonder if people can reflect in the chat on maybe how getting to know birds has enriched your life. Um, I'll hold off till the end for Annie and Holly because I want to get through the rest, but I think everybody has thousands of stories to share about that. But where does where do the benefits come for nature when we interact with our local birds? Well, these ones are really important and really easy. As soon as we, as soon as the birds gain more relevance to us in our life, we start to see ourselves and the birds as part of the same system and see how we affect them in our daily life. And this extends then to the rest of the the invertebrates and mammals and all different animals and plants and fungi that we share our space with. It, it gives us a reason to do some habitat gardening like Annie showed you a few um, weeks ago. Um, it gives us a reason to think more about understanding the water systems that we might be affecting through what we put down our sink and where we wash our cars and things. It, it gives us reason to think about even though things like climate change feel like a massive, you know, issue that we can't impact, we can through little steps, but having this connection with the local nature gives us a sense of custodianship and a need to impact our local space. And it's through, it's through protecting our local areas that we can have that global effect. So making energy efficiency changes to our houses and lives, um, it, it gives us, a deeper understanding and investment in the biodiversity crisis and habitat crisis and how these are affecting us all. Um, and this, this beginning to actually um, think about nature in terms of part of us is really key if we're going to be able to limit the impacts of these existential threats of climate crisis and biodiversity climate. And biodiversity crisis um, and I think another thing to think is that the habitat planting that you do isn't just for you and it's not just for nature it's also a community service because through planting a more biodiverse garden that brings more wildlife to your area you are actively combating the extinction of experience for the people for your neighbors around you where they might not be able to garden um, and further to that is acting as champions for nature. And this is a really important one. When we start to fall in love with our local birds, we can't help talking about it. We want to share our encounters with family and friends. And this is something we bond over. Um, and over time, the more stories, exciting stories and wonderful stories that you tell people around you about the animals that you're connecting with, the more they want that for themselves as well. Um, and being champions for nature in this way, sharing stories, sharing experiences together is so much more powerful than people think about. Um, I guess if we think about the issue of rodenticides that's really plaguing our um, predatory birds, particularly our owls, this is something that a lot of people don't think about or don't know about until they're actually engaging with someone who loves and understands their local owls. So through better connection and understanding with your local environment, our local environment, we can help the rest of us, the rest of people around us to understand the changes that we should all make to care for our shared habitat and shared community. And maybe, yeah, it's worth reflecting how getting to know your local birds might have influenced your environmental behaviour. I know it's influenced mine. And that's where I'm just going to finish up um I guess the takeaways from this are that we humans really need nature and nature needs us it's our community connecting with our local birds can actually help us deepen that connection with nature to gain the benefits for ourselves um, and for the environment around us but that connection does take effort and practice so if it's something that you're finding hard at the moment that's completely normal it's hard to schedule spending time in nature or getting little nature dose moments in our daily life. Um, but it's worth persisting with because it's incredible the amount of health and wellbeing benefits that we have to gain um, for ourselves and for our kids and for our for social cohesion in our community. Um, it's very much worth everybody spending more time actively connecting with their local environment. And 
yeah, strengthening human nature connections benefits us all, humans, the non-human, the whole planet. It's really the only way that we are going to address the massive existential crisis that we're facing, which is climate change, biodiversity crisis. These are all things that have occurred because of our continued alienation from nature. And it's only through reconnecting with ourselves and with nature in this way that we're going to tackle them. Um, so love to hear your stories. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was amazing. Oh, wow. Um, such an important thing to do to just acknowledge and and remember the fact that we are so connected to nature. And um, I've been listening to you and watching all of these fabulous stories come through the chat at the same time. Um, I am quite conscious of the time and we've just yeah, ticking sorry. over to 8 o'clock. It's okay. I think everybody has really enjoyed it. Um I did have I did have Gay popped up and said that she did have a story that she was happy to share about noisy miners in Sydney. So Gay, if you are still there, do you want to maybe unmute yourself and and if you'd like, you can pop your camera on, but you don't have to. We'd love to share your story. There she is. Hi, Gay. Hello. Uh, yes, my my parents had a house in Beecroft with a big yard. They had a very large white flowered magnolia tree, and we'd see the buds developing and the possums would eat them. So we never saw flowers on it. And they also had a group of six to 12 noisy miners living in their yard. And one day I decided I'll try one of these owls and see if that will deter the possums. Yeah. So I hung this owl up and within five minutes there were literally thousands of noisy miners attacking this this plastic owl yeah i don't know how the word spread around to come but looking at the tree it was alive with birds moving wow it just it, it lasted about 10 minutes and then they gave up because it wow. obviously wasn't working uh, yeah. it's amazing i actually really love noisy miners i i know that they're much maligned because they've adapted very well to our parkland like cities but i think they're incredible incredibly adaptive and and clever little birds and uh, yeah they are so social that's how that word would have got out yeah it was quite amazing yeah thanks gay they have noisy miners have been a hot topic of conversation i have to say through the chat yeah um, yeah, yeah, really, really interesting. And and there are there are species that, you know, on the whole, as sort of an ecologist, I look at and go, you know, we need a better way to mm. to manage our environment, seeing as we are in a managed environment mm -hmm. in urban spaces. So we can minimize their impact. You know, culling them is is not a solution and, and not something we anybody wants to go down, let alone yeah. would be successful anyway. Yeah. Um, but how do we how do we tip that balance? But at the same time. They are incredibly, you know, engaging and interesting mm -hmm. birds to just sit and watch how they interact. So it's a really, it can be a real sort of ethical, moral um, dilemma that yeah. I can find sometimes find myself sort of struggling with. Um, it's how do we best share our spaces with mm -hmm. with wildlife and and um, encourage a diversity of birds to be able yeah, to live yeah. with us. Um, there are always going to be spaces for noisy miners in urban landscapes. That's for sure. They do really yeah. well. Um, living with us and and good for them because we make it difficult, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, we've ticked over eight o'clock, so um, I think we probably, unfortunately, need to call it. But I think we could sit and share stories most of the night, by the looks of it. Um, I want to thank, um, firstly, Kathy, of course, for for joining us, um, and inspiring everybody, um, uh, with your amazing amazing stories tonight and you know, just reminding us about how amazing nature is and how good it is for us and more people need to realise that. Um, I want to also thank everybody for joining in on the chat as well. It's been really, really wonderful to see everybody so engaged and so interested. So a massive round of applause and thank you to everybody for joining us again. Um, so we are recording the session, of course. Um, I am going to upload it to our YouTube channel, so BBTV on YouTube if anybody wants to check it out. But you will get an email in the coming week with the recording in there for you to catch up with. 
and please share it with other people. You know, get mm. get these messages out there with your family and friends and neighbours um, to encourage them to connect with birds. Everybody has a bird story. So mm-hmm. I'm going to challenge everybody tonight before everybody leaves, uh, find a, find out a bird story, talk to a friend, talk to a neighbour and hear their bird story because everybody has one. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned for um, next month's webinar. We'll be advertising it in a couple of weeks. I'm not going to give it away. You can wait for the email and be surprised. It's going to be a great one. Um, thank you again, Kathy, for joining us. Thanks, everybody for making a really great session um, and we will see you next time. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having me.